this is the first time I have joined this event. Uh, uh, there was one other event that I have uh, attended uh, that Mr. Mehboob has uh, launched some time ago. Uh, Transition. Uh, yeah, and then uh, yes, this is the first time uh, I'm, 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 uh, I have joined this event and I'm interested to, to know this book. Uh, yeah, and uh, just a brief intro of uh, of me. Uh, I have I'm an IT professional, uh, and uh, with uh, 20 years of IT experience. Uh, so, and I also play golf. Um, <laughs> in fact, I, I played this morning and also yesterday, uh, full 18 holes. So it's a four hour round. So it was nice. And uh, you know this Hyderabad weather uh, has changed uh, it's quite a lot uh, in the last few days. Very nice and pleasant. So we we tee off at 5:40 a.m. in the morning, and it's fantastic. Yeah. Shridhar, 18 plus is like getting A plus or something. I don't know about <laughs> golf or not. <laughs> no, we we play 18 holes. Um, uh, that's one round. So 72 par. Uh, so uh, yeah, I try to play um, at least twice a week, uh, twice a week. So that's uh, the weekends, and also you know uh, any 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 other day you know I try to squeeze in at least nine holes. So <laughs> so it's uh, it's it's yeah I'm a, I'm an avid golfer. Yeah. So now in your nine holes, eighteen holes at par, like Greek and Latin. Over to you. <laughs> <laughs> Even for me, it's Greek and Latin. But I'm sure by the end of this event, all of us will know something about golf. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> let's start the event. A brief introduction about myself. My name is Lavinia Mudroko. I'm a Hydro Code member and uh, I dabble in poetry and I'm also an author, but I am a fiction writer mostly. I do not do non fiction. That's about a little introduction about me. Uh, so, to start with the event, I want to begin this event with a beautiful quote by Nelson Mandela. The quote goes like this. He says, um, Sir Nelson Mandela, the greatest glory in living lies not in never failing, falling. The greatest glory in living lies not in never falling, but in rising every time we fall. And that's what Hydra believes in as well. And we try to help our fellow writers and readers in rising. Uh, in giving them a platform for promoting or marketing their book. And also, at the same time, we try to connect the readers, on the other hand, who are who come to know that there is a book available and they can go ahead and read it. So, Hydro, which stands for Hyderabad Readers and Writers, strives to build this bridge connecting the readers and writers. We have often seen... Uh, that right, uh, there are many platforms, not only in Hyderabad, but elsewhere in India, and probably in even in US or in other countries, which is like one sided, which either is a writer's platform or mostly a reader's platform. We do not want to do that. We want to bring readers and writers together, and which is what is our core mission. Our long term objective is to groom and nurture our readers into subject matter experts and motivational speakers or life coaches and the writers into national best-selling authors. So that was a little, uh, a very short introduction about Hydro and what we do at Hydro. And Hydro stands for Hyderabad Readers and Writers. So before I move further, let me first welcome our chief guest, Mr. Srinivasa Adepalli. Kimi is the founder and CEO of Global Gyan Academy, an edtech startup in professional education and upskill. After graduating from NIT Surat and IIM Ahmedabad, Kimi went on to the corporate world of strategy, marketing, and MD. MD stands for mergers and acquisitions. He was the chief strategy officer at Tata Communications when he quit his job. He became a visiting faculty at various IIMs, IIT Hyderabad, NMIMs, etc. He started his entrepreneurial venture in 2016. During his engineering college days, Srini wrote a column on hostel life for the youth magazine, Jam. 
25 years later, he published hostilities that based on the stories that were written as they happened. Srini has also written extensively on strategy, technology, and leadership for various magazines and newspapers. His case studies on management have been published by ISB Hyderabad and IV Business School, Canada. So welcome, Srinivas Aripalli, sir. I think you like to be called as Srini, as given in your <laughs> introduction. So I'll follow it. I'll just call you Srini. So welcome, Srini. Warm welcome from Hydra, on behalf of Hydra and myself. So how are you today? How are you feeling today? Good, good. I think it's a great platform and I'm happy to to have been introduced to uh, to this group of avid uh, readers and writers. I think that's also very interesting, as you mentioned, uh, an interesting combination uh, for, for a group that you've created. Great, sir. So before I pass on to the mic to Srini uh, to address briefly this event, I would like to also introduce our guest of honor today and whose book we will be launching. Uh, the book title is Play. Play It Where It Lies, written by Mr. Don P.V. A little introdu a brief introduction of Mr. P.V. Don E. P.V. Sr. is the former editor of a poetry magazine and a former editor of an award-winning newspaper. He has had a book published through a vanity press and has self-published three books. He has had two books published through traditional publishing companies, one of which became an ethics textbook. So he is in no way new to the writing business. Mr. P.V. taught religious studies, philosophy, ethics, and administration of justice at the University of Phoenix. He practiced law in Fort Worth, Texas, before graduating from Brick Divinity School and pursuing a PhD at Claremont Graduate University. PV served as pastor of McCarthy Memorial Christian Church in Los Angeles and is now a retired minister of the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. He is a prolific writer and is well versed in many genres of writing. A very warm welcome, Mr. PV. And it's a great pleasure to have you here. So how are you feeling this evening? So I'm feeling I great. I'm feeling excited. Uh, I'm feeling good. I, 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 I feel like uh, a woman feels when she's in labor and she's <laughs> about to deliver the baby. You know? <laughs> I, I get it. I understand the feeling. Every book is actually making a baby. You have yes. to go through so much process, so I totally get it. Yes. So that's yes. very nice of you, sir. So before we launch uh, the book of Mr. PV and uh, uh, throw a question and answers round and get to know more about Mr. PV, his experiences, and about the book, let's first hear it from Srini, our chief guest for the event. So, Srini, over to you. Thank you. Now, many years ago, when uh, I was doing my MBA, uh, one of our profs uh, told us to read a book. Uh, he said, it's one of the best books for you to learn about management, strategy, operations. Uh, you must read it. And now, you know, the toppers, they went and got the two books, the two copies that were available in the library. And I was like, how do I get hold of this book? So I went and actually bought it. You know, in college days, you don't really want to spend money buying books. But since it came so well recommended, I bought it. And the book was called Goal. Okay. And I started reading it. And when I started reading it, you no, know, it was about the story of this guy who is having marital problems, who is having issues with his boss and, uh, and all that. And I, I read a few pages and said, where's the management stuff in this? This, this is just like you know, a fiction story. Uh, uh, but and where's this going? But, you know, like any good story, uh, it, it made me curious because I, I wanted to know what, what is going to happen to this guy. Uh, his wife's leaving him. He's going to, about to get a divorce. He's losing his job. Uh, so I, I wanted to know what happens next. And I, I delved into it. And thankfully, I did so because I ended up reading one of the, probably as my prof had said, 
the one of the best books on management and strategy and operations uh, and what i realized as i finished reading that book is that how you could write a book on management and such profound knowledge uh, in the form of a story uh, and, and i think that had a huge impact on me because when i started my corporate career as a uh, as a strategist as a as a manager as a leader uh, i realized that you know the power of storytelling uh, is not just if you are going to write a novel uh, it's really about the power of of connecting with people the power of leading people uh, and whatever you do uh, you know you can apply the power of storytelling and of course i continue to uh, to use storytelling as a very important element of the way i made presentations the way i i wrote my business communication uh, you know in a variety of roles that i did in the way i managed my team and other people that i was engaging with uh, and and that has continued this this idea that storytelling is such a such an important capability that one needs to build uh, for instance when i built my uh, uh, whole course on strategy uh, i began the course on strategy and of course all you folks from hyderabad will will surely know that i built the entire introduction around bahubali right around stuff that happens in bahubali and how Uh, uh how we can pick up some of the learnings of strategy from the war scenes that happen in bahubali and in fact we realize that management um, has often uh, borrowed from history and 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 warfare to teach leadership to teach strategy etc uh, and another popular uh, you know metaphor or analogy that is used by us uh, in teaching particularly strategy teamwork etc uh i i when we want to teach culture is sports right? and uh, so we we resort to examples from sports as a way to uh, to teach uh, to teach these concepts and therefore a few you know a few days ago when i was asked to uh, to participate in this uh, in this program and i was told that uh, you know there's a book and you know please read it and also join the event i looked at the cover i looked at the picture it was about golfing uh, that's what it appeared to me i because there was a picture of this golfer uh, and i said you know i really don't know anything about golf uh, apart from uh, a little bit of golf that i played on my v uh, and uh, usually you know uh, adjusting the the bin and everything else and playing uh, golf on the v i have never had any experience with golf i said what am i going to re- to do read a book about about golf no uh, what value can i add but uh, as usual uh, i was given something to read i couldn't i couldn't resist it so i said let me start with a few pages and i realized that uh, yes it was a story of golf uh, that began but also a story of a person so i said okay where is this going and then you know as i kept reading i realized it is a story of life uh, it, it was a book about uh, philosophy it was a book about uh, how how we can lead our life and so it is so easy for me to connect the dots to what happened about 25 years ago when i read the first book on of goal and it was all about stories and and things that didn't seem to have any connection to the to the topic until you uh, you 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 got involved in the storytelling and play it where it lies was for me an interesting experience of uh, of bringing those memories back and maybe I, i i'll take a couple of minutes just to talk a little bit about you know uh, for me i i recently wrote uh, uh, a novel i never thought that i would be writing a fiction novel at this time of my life uh, everyone expected that i would publish some books on management strategy leadership that's what everyone expect uh, from me so when i uh, published uh, a book on uh, no juvenile life of living in a hostel during college days right completely uh, different but i i for me i don't see any difference uh, you know when it, whether it's fiction or non fiction whether it's management whether it's a novel i think it's really about the power of storytelling and that's the power uh, of storytelling that all of us as readers uh, learn and all of us who write must must try and bring it and and not just as writers but as uh, you know as leaders as parents uh, i think if we can use the power of storytelling to engage better with with the people around us i i think it will bring out the best of us and it will bring out everyone else so 
uh, and the great thing about storytelling is something that we have learned from childhood uh, now everyone is a storyteller uh, all you need to do is to to find one person uh, and start telling stories and i think everyone can be a writer uh, everyone can be a storyteller so i wish you all all the best uh, in your journey of reading and uh, and writing uh, stories and uh, i look forward to hearing from don uh, on on the process that he followed in in writing this wonderful book thank you and thank you to the uh, hydra team for uh, giving me an opportunity to to be part of this uh, this this program and of course look forward to uh, to the rest of the evening thank you thank you shrini we also look forward for more discussion on this topic but yes have you, even i'm excited i also want to know from don how he has related golf with life i know nothing about golf total greek and latin but i hope to find out here i guess all of us are here to find that out uh, mr pv uh, but uh, a I quick point a quick question to shrini if i may davanya yeah yeah sure sure uh, this this art of storytelling shrini uh, can it be practiced on the spouse <laughs> you know okay. uh, <laughs> whenever i actually teach a, a whole program for a lot of uh, you now it companies tech companies uh, uh, i'm just actually running a uh, a program of 25 batches on the on the topic of influencing persuasion and communication okay and i usually begin with a disclaimer at this uh, at the start of my uh, learning workshop that uh, you can apply this and i will kind of give some assurance of that it will be successful on anyone including you can influence your boss you can try to do this storytelling on your boss your team members customers but the one person that i give no no guarantee for and i would also caution you not to apply any of this is the spouse so so same thing uh, my caution uh, anything that i say uh, the disclaimer is except spouse right so influence all stakeholders except spouse <laughs> Th thanks Shini I would have, I would have taken some risks tonight uh, by you but I re I'll restrain myself I hope the Thank disclaimer you. applies to our spouses also I mean yeah uh, that's why it's not <laughs> so so Lavanya well, I, I think Mahbub was was very gender uh, you know neutral in his question yeah I know uh, it's a spouse not mine yes. yeah that's right so <laughs> yeah all right so um Okay, so um, Swapnil, if you're there, uh, just a minute. I need some clarification, Swapnil. Swapnil, did you know? yes. Hi, Davinia. Sorry. Uh, so, Swapnil, are we launching the book, or the book is already launched, and we can just. Um, so we are not launching it. Okay, I think um, Don has to talk to his publisher to get that. So, what we'll do is after the event, I'll share the link in the group. That would be great. Yeah, so we were actually um, today. This is the uh, world world worldwide launch of the book, and we were trying to have this American publisher also join the call and have it launch here due to some uh, technical glitch or difficulty. We were not able to do it, but the book is already out there. And uh, like Sapneel said, yes, we will uh, share the link after the uh, event or during the event, and all of you can then uh, read the book as well. So, so I think we'll have to let go with the usual our usual process of launching and all. But congratulations, uh, Mr. P. V. On behalf of all the Hydra, and it's a little loss to us that we were not able to launch. Usually, we launch in the event and we have these drum rolls and we have a nice way of <laughs> yes. And who has told? But we'll clap for you uh, and congratulate you on this new journey, on this new baby. Thank and you. I, I, and I guess everybody, we all wish you on behalf of Hydra that the book is successful. So let's talk about the book now. Uh, yes, and if my book can you again share the screen, please, with the poster, so that we can see the cover and you know what we're talking about. Uh, just for a few minutes. Yes. So, sir, we want to hear it from you. Why the title? Play it where it lies. Well. The title comes from an actual conversation uh, that I had with a gentleman who was trying to teach me how to play golf. And 
and uh, we were in undergrad to get school together and uh, we were planning to go to law school together and he said I needed uh, a hobby of that sort and so we started playing golf and I hit the ball and it went the opposite direction of where I wanted it to go and uh, I run over and where the ball is and I'm about to pick it up and move it in a better spot. He said, whoa, you got to play it where it lies. And, and that's where the title of the book came from. From that instruction uh, from his one Rainer uh, who told me to play it where it lies. Okay, that's very nice to know that it all started with a small conversation. But how did you think that you would write a book on this title? And, uh, well, so it, it, it probably did not happen overnight. Yeah, you had your own process. So, how did I mean this experience? How did this journey happen? And this entire uh, manuscript of hundred or so many pages came out. Yes, um, as I learned to play golf. The I began to, I, and I don't know exactly what inspired me, but somehow I began to see a connection between golf and life. Uh, and uh, I that was particularly true when I started practicing law, and I saw how many good people got themselves in such serious trouble, and how even. Uh, uh, people that are profoundly religious uh, uh, get themselves in trouble. And so what I wanted to do is the book began to take shape in grad school when I was studying philosophy. And I said, you know, all this stuff about syllogism and this, that, and the other it just drives me crazy. Uh, I, I used to get into arguments with my philosophy teacher. I said, of oh, what value is that? You know, what, what, what use, what we need is a philosophy that is practical, that people can use, not just theoretical, but a practical philosophy. And, and I went back to golf. And from that, I started weaving these stories together. Yes. Point well made, sir. Practical philosophy, yes. I think it's a need of the hour. Uh, there's so many books out there, scripts and scripts, pages and pages of philosophy, very high level languages, but what's the value? Like Shini said before when well, he was talking, what is the value? So, Shini, dare to make a comment on the practical philosophy or. Yeah. And I think that's a, uh, that's a very good point that today, uh, you know, we are looking at very distracted audiences, right? People don't have the time. We are in a, an environment where uh, a few images on Instagram shape our view of the world uh, or uh, a few tweets is what we use to know what's happening in the entire world instead of reading through uh, articles and magazine. So, so in, in such a distracted world, I think it is important to also take something as useful uh, as philosophy, uh, but convert it into something that people will ultimately use. Because while there is space for the for the esoteric learning and the development of that field, but equally, if we don't translate it into something practical and useful, um, I, I think that uh, you know, the, what's the point of it all? And equal, uh, I can think of another example of of behavioral economics which was studied and which was developed for decades. But now, only now in the last, I think, 10, 15 years, we are seeing such practical applications and Nobel Prize winners have, have written about it. So I, I think it's also what Don said, that many of us, if you understand the, the theory, we in some ways owe it to, to the world to also find ways to make it, make it useful. Uh, and, and there's value in that. And there's a lot of value in that. And I think that's a great attempt. Uh, again here of taking all of those learnings and bringing it to simple rules, simple stories that anyone can read and say, oh, I can understand this. It's not language that, that you have to 
you need a dictionary to understand what's being said right? that's what most most philosophy books would be they would put put you to sleep but uh, but the the approach that has been followed i think is very valuable so <coughs> so mr pv how much time did you take to complete this manuscript i see there are a lot of examples a lot of uh, effort has gone into it so so the day from when you thought i mean when the actual conversation happened and the time to bring out this book so how much how much time it was uh, it took several years uh, yes my years. goodness yes uh, i uh, because i think the book was first published in 2016 Uh-huh. and some of the stories i tell are from a much earlier time and so that it lets me to know uh that the book it took a, a good couple of years to put it together uh because at the time i was pastor in a church i was going to grad school i, I had so much going on i didn't have that much time to write uh, and then i put something together and it just didn't seem right so i just had to keep reworking it and reworking it and reworking it till it sounded right to me many years wow that's that's a culmination of a lot of your experiences i guess because right. as a book grows or as the time grows even we grow as a person so yeah i it's it's a process i there's a gentleman on the internet who has a course how to write a book over a weekend when well, i can't imagine <laughs> writing a book i don't know what kind of book one could write over a weekend <laughs> i i i i was tempted to take the course just to find out how to how one could write a book over a weekend <laughs> thank god you did not take it <laughs> uh, yeah that's <laughs> yeah. So uh I think it's now time to read a short passage from the book. So Shirisha Uh Shirisha are you there? Yeah yeah I'm here uh Lavanya. Hi Shirisha. So Hi. Shirisha is one of the our hydro members and she will be reading a passage from the book. So Shirisha over to you. Yeah. Okay. So uh there is this interesting passage that I've come across about karma from this book. so i would want to read that and here it goes i'm audible right lavanya yes yes thank yes you. thank you okay there is a fundamental law of nature that our actions and inactions thoughts and feelings wants and desires have implications of karma we either accumulate ne- uh, negative karma that weighs us down or accumulate positive karma to sail among the stars karma attaches to our soul and when we incur too much negative karma we become weighed we become weighed down and cannot move forward or upward it may be that the engrams that are the targets of l ron hubbard's clearing process are nothing more than the residue of negative karma when i was a little boy One of my favorite comic strip characters was the Silver Surfer. I eagerly waited for each new edition to see what far away places in the galaxy the Silver Surfer would find adventure. I began to imagine without any religious persuasion that the Silver Surfer was a metaphor for how our lives are. That is, the less baggage we possess, the higher we can sail among the clouds. and then with the stars after the soul is released from our body as i grew older and commenced my studies the concept of karma became clear to me and i came to understand it as a universal concept we say what goes around comes around the wiccans have a quote the bad one does always return to one threefold jesus said one reaps what one sows An old African proverb says, "Ashes fly back to the face of him who throws them." These sayings reflect different names for the same universal principle, karma. Karma is a principle that governs our lives every millisecond of our existence. We cannot escape its effect. For instance, 
The young lady kept saying she was sorry to the homeless man embedded in her automobile windshield. Like so many others among us, she thought that saying she was sorry would somehow lessen the weight of her crimes. She thought that saying she was sorry would erase her deficits from the book of universal liabilities. She discovered at her trial of how wrong she was. So it is with people everywhere who think that saying those two words, I'm sorry, will ameliorate the karma of negative actions. It does not and will not. This is all the more reason why the path we choose is of such critical importance. The way I'm advocating will help one to avoid having to say those meaningless words. As the late William Ward said, love means never having to say I'm sorry. Likewise, obeying the rules of play it where it lies means experiencing ever fewer times when one will have to say those meaningless expressions. Thank you. Well done. Hey. <laughs> Beautiful passage. And uh, I mean, it's really so magnificent. You have the kind of correlated karma, Jesus, and uh, silver surfer, and um, I mean, everything together, and even golf. I mean, the golf comes in the end. So beautiful. So, I mean, karma is mostly like they say it is associated with Hindu uh, or more, mostly to Indian countries. And uh, even though now this concept is catching up in uh, other countries of the world, but mostly it's like in a Indian concept or more like uh, related to Hinduism. So, how did you meet karma? Or how did you come across karma? And how did karma, I mean, was embedded into golf? Can you please like share your thoughts on that? Please. Yeah, I, actually, it started with the Beatles song, Instant Karma is <laughs> Gonna Get You. And I never really uh, knew what karma meant until I went to college and started studying Eastern religion. And it just, the, the concept of karma just seems so natural to me. It just resonated with me. Uh, because, in, and I'm a, my major in undergrad was English literature. So I read a lot of Shakespeare and, and, and how people can have a flaw in them. And that flaw will lead them to, to a destructive life. Uh, uh, and to me, that flaw could be the same as karma, you know, that somehow, somewhere, uh, you know, you've taken on this, this bad weight and you can't get rid of it. And it, it just drags you down and carries you uh, to destruction. Uh, so... Um, Karma does it just makes perfect sense uh, to me, and and I see it as 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 the reader said in all these different ways that karma manifests itself, you know. And you can't just say I'm sorry and get rid of it, uh, or go to church and and confess to a priest and give him ten dollars and you, he says go. You know, say 10 Hail Marys and you'll be all right. You ain't going to be all right. <laughs> you know, so uh, it, it's, it's, for me, it's real. It's a universal principle. And I still hold on to that. So on a funny note, or maybe just to lighten the atmosphere, eh? is there karma in God? <laughs> well. How, how do you tackle karma in God? <laughs> I mean, it, it, when you play golf, I mean, you, there's karma influences there. You hit the ball wrong. You, your whole uh, approach to the green is going to be bad, right? You hit a tree and the, and the ball bounces out and way out yonder somewhere. Now you got to take some penalty strokes to get back uh, to the fairway to get up to the green. So, uh, you, you know, you can make the wrong choice. You know, what about the guy that takes uh, a, a nine iron, he wants to chip the ball to the poor three hole, 
and he, and and then he looks. He said, "Well, it might not. It might be too much, her." So then he takes out something else and he hits the ball and it barely gets up the fairway. So uh, you you know he's gonna have to, he or she is gonna have to make corrections along the way. But the first hit of the ball is gonna have a big impact on how that journey goes. Do you agree with that, Mr. Shibesh? Chad, can you share some thoughts on that, just on what Mr. Uh, said now? Uh, yes, definitely. I mean, I think that's that's how it it it, it works. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, first ball know, decides the game. Uh, no, no, not necessarily. Uh, all your thoughts decide the game. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and also, your also your playing partners. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> So that, that that's uh, I think that's the important thing. Uh, but yes, uh, uh, you know all these thoughts uh, uh, change your game, and uh, and when you're playing with your buddies, um, uh, I think that matters. Um, and all these positive vibes that that you know that you carry along uh, the course uh, that really matters uh, as you play along. Um, uh, yes, I agree with Mr. Don uh, PV. Um, uh, you know. Um, once you have a negative thought, uh, you know, and then you know it's all downhill from there. So, so I, <laughs> I, I completely totally agree with you. Uh, and and uh, as far as the name of the book, uh, you know, play uh, as as it lies. Uh, you know, uh, for for our, in our course we have a rule. Uh, we don't necessarily play where it lies. <laughs> That's partly because we have a lot of brown patches on on our, on the fairways. So. <laughs> <laughs> so we are allowed to move it. So, oh. uh, so that, that's an exception. No, I, I'm just kidding. So it's it's not part of uh, what you meant, but <laughs> that's that's what. <laughs> okay, nice. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. So in the book, uh, not only karma, but I have seen that there are a lot of examples, a lot of stories, a uh, lot of stories from real life. Some also went far as crime stories, and that you have related to the rules of life, the philosophy of life, giving an example from the book. So, how did you choose these experiences? Probably, and some of them are also your own experiences, right? Your own conversation, your own personal uh, experiences. So, how did you choose them or shortlisted them? To include them, because not everything that we undergo, we hear, we see. We can have it in the book. So, how difficult was that, or how easy was that? How did you? I, I studied uh, Joseph Campbell a lot. I don't. I don't know if you you're familiar with Joseph Campbell, but he was very influential in the development of Star Wars. Uh, Joseph Campbell uh, was a. Uh, you could call him a, sim a symbolist. Most of his life was spent interpreting symbols. And he, he, he had this thing about humans or storytelling animals, you know, and, and, and the power of storytelling. And I decided that when I write, that's what I wanted to do is tell stories. Uh, because people, it's how we humans communicate in the beginning. Uh, it's, it's telling stories. I, I remember growing up, uh, I did not know my grandparents, but my dad would sit out on the porch a lot of time and, and tell us just all kinds of stories, uh, sometimes to try to frighten us into doing what's right. Uh, but but I enjoyed that, and it and it's something that we miss, I think, in our culture today, uh, with so many electronic devices, uh, we miss the power of telling stories, you know. And that's what I want to do is is um, because uh, it's hard to think in the abstract, but when you talk tell a story, you know, like Jesus did, right? He, he told all these parables, these stories, uh, and it, it's a great teaching tool. And it helps to get the point across, right? Rather than just talking a lot of abstract concepts, 
uh, you you tell a story and, and then explain how that story makes the point that you want to make. <clears throat> so, so all these years of your personal experiences, stories, some good stories, some stories, some parables, some um, fables maybe, so everything put together in this, but uh, what I was thinking is, you were also doing philosophy, studying philosophy while you were writing. So yeah. for this book, did you like had to go to that extra effort of doing some more research on philosophy, uh, reading some more books, or, or it was just your personal insights or your life experiences that became the book? Yes, I did not do any research because I wanted, I wanted a, to tell a story, right? Mm -hmm. and, and if I had research, I'm telling somebody else's story. And I did not want to do that. Although I do quote uh, some philosophers, and particularly D.Z. Phillips. Uh, he was one of my instructors at graduate school. And, and I so enjoyed meeting him and listening and studying under him. So I do quote uh, D.Z. Phillips a few times. But uh, I didn't want it to be uh, a research book. I wanted to. To, you know, and I may have recalled some of these stories differently, but not very differently. Uh, and so that's what I wanted. I wanted something uh, that's my own reflection, my reflection on life. And these stories help make the points uh, that I want to make. And some of them are quite sad. I mean, some of these stories, I mean, they're depressing sometimes when you read them. <laughs> but they're true. And I mean, that's the way the life is. Yeah. So uh, was there any challenge? Like, it took over the years because you were still developing it. Uh, and you wanted to add more stories to it. Or were there any challenges? Like, you got stuck at some point of time. What did you do? Like, did you go refer to your philosophical friend or you said just let me keep it down for now I'll resume it later or any some major incident that happened during this that you had to kind of shut it down and say I'm not doing it now I'll continue later something like that so you want to know uh, your, uh, yeah. the, 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 my excerpt that I chose uh, to read tonight is, is the story that the uh, previous reader uh, mentioned uh uh, the Chante Mallet story. And that story really caused me a lot of anguish, trying to understand how this young woman who was trained as a nurse's aide uh, could do what she did. And uh, that story still resonates with me, trying to understand the depth of what this young lady must have been experiencing. Uh, and, uh, you know, I walked away for a couple of weeks and I wanted to try to see how the trial went. And uh, so I didn't finish the book until after uh, her trial uh, because I wanted to try, I wanted to try to understand it. Not uh, sometimes uh, you just can't understand something. Uh, you know, I, I remember one time I got in trouble in a class because, um, I don't know if you remember this, but some years ago we had this lady in Houston, Texas that went home and drowned her four children in the bathtub. And so one day I'm lecturing and I say to my students, I can understand how a woman suffering from post-mortem depression and drown, drown her four children in a bathtub. I can understand that. And then they ran down to the dean's office and I had to go explain myself uh, to the dean. But I can understand. But some things I just can't understand. And uh, uh, her story is one of those stories that is still called, every time I read that passage, it bothers me.
because she was a beautiful person, had a good future. All of her clients liked her and loved her. They even testified at her trial. But something went awry in her life that caused her to do what she did. And I, uh, it's hard to understand that kind of stuff. <laughs> So when I was reading your book, and I came to this exact same point about this nurse who was telling me. I mean, for a minute, I was like shocked. I mean, I mean the same thing, it kind of bothered me. But, and then you ended the chapter with the golf flu, like how probably her psyche at that time was. So uh, Don, you said uh, that you had chosen an experience. Except, did you choose and accept of this story? Then I think yeah. we should, yeah, I think we should read yeah. it because you kind of didn't tell that entire story, but just left a hand. So let the all the people okay. here, yes, they'll also know the story, and we would also like to read a passage. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I will read that for you. Yes. For example. Consider the tragic tale of Shante Mallard, a 27-year-old nurse's aide living and working in Fort Worth, Texas. One night, invigorated with the date drug ecstasy and all by alcohol, this young lady spends a long night partying with her friends at a local night spot. On her way home, during those bewitching hours following midnight. Oops, I went too far. Okay. Let's see. Following her automobile struck a homeless man who was catapulted into her windshield. Undaunted by the unfortunate turn of events, Shante continued her drive home with the man embedded in her windshield. Upon arriving home, she pulled into her garage and left the man there. Several times throughout the night, she returned to the man and whispered to him how sorry she was. Meanwhile, she telephoned her boyfriend who came over and comforted her with more alcohol and marijuana while they engaged in passionate sex. Later identified as 37-year-old Gregory Biggs, the unfortunate homeless man gave up the ghost and passed into that eternal darkness. The next day, Shante and her boyfriend noticed Biggs was dead. So they telephoned some friends who came over and helped them dispose of the body. Only the random act of someone close to her who made an anonymous call to the police department brought to life, life this horrible tale, which had been relegated to the closet of family secrets for four months. Shante was eventually arrested and brought to trial. Despite a forceful and courageous defense, she was found guilty of murder and sentenced to 50 years in prison. How did this happen? How could this young lady, trained and skilled in the science of preserving life and comforting the afflicted, stray so far from the path to which she had been assigned. Was it the drugs, the alcohol, the bewitching hour? Indeed, Florence Nightingale must have turned over in the proverbial grave at the sight of this tragedy. It is instructive to note that this was not a case of a lack of having the proper tools or a failure to instruct nor can it be attributed to inexperience. This young lady had been appropriately trained and had worked many years as a nurse's aide. Several of her former clients testified at her trial on her behalf, and yet 
this player in the game of life faced an unplayable lie. And what did she do? She took out her iron, iron and oh gosh. Sorry, I keep going too far. Okay, lost. That's okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're not reading the entire book, so that's okay. <laughs> A few passages. Emma, this is like very shocking and disturbing incident. I can understood. I can understand why you were disturbed for so many days and you had to stop it. Yeah, it's it's I mean I you can't help but feel sorry for the lady. I mean, certainly we feel sorry for the man too, because uh, he died. I mean, I mean, but to let somebody stay in your windshield all night long, suffering, bleeding, and and dying. And she was a nurse. And she, her job was to save people, basically. Mm -hmm. but that night, I don't know what happened to her. Okay, I think yeah, it's getting a lot <laughs> depressing. <we should. laughs> Move ahead from that. Oh, it's really short. So, all right. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just, I'm still. Okay, so anybody have any questions at this point of time? Let's see. Otherwise, I'll be keep on talking. So, maybe if uh, Don, I have a, a question or a, just an observation. I think it's an interesting. Thing that you said about golf as a as a as a sport that's not really a competition against others, uh, but uh, but something where you are really competing against yourself, uh, and your so-called rivals are potentially your partners. Uh, so so maybe if you could just expand a bit on that, I, I found that to be a very interesting thing because you always think of sport as a as a battle. Uh, you know, between players, right? and I, I felt that as a very useful way of thinking about life itself. Right? So maybe if you could share that. Yes, uh, that that was one of those fascinating things about golf that I came to understand is that you're really not playing against other players. You're playing against yourself. You're playing against nature, right? Uh, because the other player has nothing to do with how you hit that ball, right? The other players have nothing to do uh, with how you, when you get on the green, you look and line up and decide how to hit, uh, tap the ball ends into the cup. So uh, you really, I, you know, oftentimes we look at golf as a competition, which it is. It's a game. It's a competition. But it is a competition between me and nature, between me and myself. Right. With Tiger, you know, if you ever listen to Tiger Woods, when he mess up, he says, it's me. Right. He doesn't say somebody made me do it. He said, he said my back was hurting or whatever the case may have been. I need to practice more. Uh, but he accepts responsibility. And, 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 and that's a beautiful thing about golf. That's why they call it the gentleman sport. Right? Uh, there's so much about golf that it's just different. Uh, from most uh, sports that makes it something special. A gentleman's game. Let's hear it from Mr. Sridhar, the actual golfer. Mr. Sridhar, <laughs> <laughs> do you agree? <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah, I'm here, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, yes. Sir. Uh, yes, it is, it is. I agree with uh, uh, Mr. Don uh, Peavy. Uh, it is a gentleman's game uh, and it is a very difficult game to play. Uh, it's not an easy game at all. Uh, but uh, yes, I, I have not read the book, but um, uh, I, I can, I, I, from what I have read, uh, heard so far, uh, I, I can, uh, I, I can, I, I can uh, you know, maybe draw some conclusions. Uh, 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 but, but yes, uh, I, I definitely want to uh, take a look at the book. Um, uh, and and uh, and share it to uh, in my group in my golf group 
um, so that my friends can also uh, have, have a perspective of what uh, Mr. Don uh, wants to say. Uh, that I'm sure it will be a very interesting, uh, interesting read uh, for for all of us uh, to 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 better uh, ourselves, to be a better uh, human being, and also a good golf player. Uh, I think uh, that that uh, really helps. Thank you, sir. But one thing that Mr. P V was saying was golf is a game by against yourself, against nature, rather than against the other players. Uh, yes, most most part of his uh, part of what uh, you 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 play is uh, it's your own own shot. You know, every shot matters, and uh, every the next shot is the important shot in golf. Uh, so you hit a previous one, and and it's it, it's in the woods. Uh, so you try to recover, and then you know try to be back, uh, uh, try to 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 par it. Uh, you know <laughs> that's what Tiger Woods does most of the time, but uh, we we uh, we don't do it. We <laughs> we cannot. So we try to you know practice a lot. Uh, yes, definitely it's uh, it's it's all uh, uh, it's 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 up to us how we uh, how we play the game uh, without getting actually uh, being impacted by the previous shot. Uh, so I think that's the the that message is very uh, very well taken and understood. Um, but uh, you know, but also it's very difficult uh, because um, because uh, you know you get carried away by by you know such things happening and uh, and it takes time to recover and then the experience counts. Uh, you know, the more you play, uh, the more better uh, player uh, we, we become. And uh, this actually shows in the tournaments uh, that we play. I play. Uh, it's not easy uh, to control yourself. Um, uh, Unless unless you you play more and more where where you are um, uh, where you understand yourself and you know and try to be a better person, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful insight. Mm. Lavanya, I have a question. Yes, Sir Vishay, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, congratulations for your book release, Don. And uh, my question is. I was wondering oh, when I first saw the title of the book, where it lies, like plate where it lies. For me, it sounds something like in life, there are a number of options to do, but then do where your capability or your capacity lies or where you can actually succeed because all success or whatever that is, it is not same for all. For someone, making money is big. For someone, glory is big. For someone, something else is big. But then make sure that you're choosing what is your area of, you know, what you are longing for. Absolutely. Now, play where it lies implies that we, I mean, when Donald Trump got started in the real estate business, his father gave him a million dollars. Most of us don't have parents who can give us a million dollars to get started in business, right? So, but there are other ways. I mean, that if I'm starting a business, I might be able to raise money. Um, I can do crowdfunding. I can go to my family and friends. I, I can sell off my assets if I have any. Uh, so, Donald Trump may have gotten started ahead of me, but that doesn't mean I'm going to always be behind. Uh, I play my game the way it is. Wherever my ball lies, I play the game and, and try to make it to the cup, you see, uh, irregardless of what's going on around me. But I have to be honest with myself. And I have to, uh, you know, I talk about authenticity in the book, uh, that you have to be an authentic person. You have to uh, admit to yourself uh, what your strengths and weaknesses are. I mean, that's a management thing, I understand. But, uh, you know, you have to identify your own strengths and weaknesses and maximize your strengths, minimize your weaknesses, right, to get the job done. Because... When a golfer, when, when you, say you have three people playing golf together and each one tees off, 
their playing is going to be based on where the ball lies. And somebody, you know, I don't know how Tiger Woods does it, but he has one of the longest uh, uh, distances in golf. You know, he can hit the ball four or 500 yards. Uh, well, other people are like 250, 300, something like that. But you have to play your ball where it lies. And if, if, Ty, if, you, if you're playing against Tiger Woods and he can hit the ball farther than you, you have to hit it more accurately, right? And yeah. so it's, that's what I mean when I say play it where it lies. All of us are not born the same way with the same things and stuff and parents. Some people are born without parents. And, uh, you know, but that's no excuse. You have to play where, where your ball lies. And, 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 it, and if you do that, and if you're honest with yourself, uh, you can make it. I honestly believe that. You can make it. I come from a family of 22 children. My mom and dad had 22 children. Um, you know, we lived in a two-bedroom, one-bathroom house. We, we, when we took a bath as children, we, we bathed six at a time, seven at a time. You know, uh, because mom had to heat the water on the stove, and she wasn't going to be packing that bucket all night. And, and, and so uh, I know what it means to be poor, but that's not an excuse to go out and commit crimes and violence, right? It just means I got a harder job. Very applause. Applause here for such a wonderful insight. Right. I don't want to start preaching here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> pastor was always a pastor. Right, sir? Yes, 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 yes. You have to stop me because I get to preach it after a while. Well, that was wonderful. I mean, you said it right. So, okay. so Vishay, did, did Mr. PV answer your question? Uh he, he did answer, but then I, I have a, you know, a continuous question, like a subsequent question for, uh, after this. The thing is, like, I often wonder, like, what am I good at? And that itself becomes a big problem because everyone says, do what you are good in or exactly like play where it lies. But the fundamental question is, I, I'm still not coming in terms with understanding what I'm good at because everything looks good. Like for some time, I f maybe it's like a beginner's luck or something, and then I I lose interest out of that. So I'm just trying to understand how how do I figure what I'm good at? Like, is it if if I'm getting some money, I get uh, uh, does that mean I'm good at, or is it I'm getting more interest that means I'm good at, or wh what is the determining factor that says yes I am good at something? For that, you have to read the book, all the rules. <laughs> yeah, I think you should read the book. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good answer. Good sure. answer. You should Mr. read Don the book. Mr. Don doesn't want to reveal all the 40 or whatever number of golf rules. <laughs> all yes. right. You know, uh, Joseph Campbell uses the word bliss. He says that each of us have to find our bliss. Nobody can do it for us. We have to do it ourselves. We but have to find I don't know what my bliss is. Huh? No, I, I, I don't know what my bliss is. An ephemeral joy cannot be called as bliss, right? I have a lot of fleeting moments of, you know, excitement, fun, entertainment, whatever you call it as, like that happiness. But then bliss is of a totally different quality. I, I and What I understand by the word bliss is like it's, it's happiness for a prolonged time, but I have like ephemeral, like, you know, a fleeting moments of happiness, but that, do I call that as bliss or is there something beyond that? Uh, being a pastor, I think you would be the best person to answer this. I'm just trying to understand that thing. I, I, I often wonder. Only this question a lot of say. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not a psychiatrist. Uh, so uh, I would, uh, and that was a brilliant I answer. To, uh, to read the book, I think it, 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 you will pick up some some keys to how one goes about discovering one's bliss. But bliss is more than just happiness. Uh, bliss is coupled with passion, that you feel passionate about this thing that makes you happy. 
Right. Uh, so, I mean, you're still a young man. You, you've got plenty of time. Uh, you, you'll find it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I, 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 Abhishek, I think there's no structured metho methodology to find your North Star or your calling. It will come to you. Yeah, I've been you. waiting for quite some time now. I'm getting impatient. <laughs> <laughs> what is your cause? What is your calling? What is your North Star? It will come. It will happen. There's no structured formula or methodology to find it. That self-discovery will happen. Well, <laughs> I, I almost reached to a place where like, people started saying that you know, life really doesn't have any purpose. Okay. Yeah, this is all stupidity that humans have imposed on themselves thinking that, okay, there is some purpose to the life, but life itself doesn't have a purpose. But then I'm constantly kind of battling my own thoughts, trying to understand whether my life has some purpose or life itself is a purposeless or how do we define the purpose? Okay. Another time mm -hmm. for that? Sure, sure. Yeah. Anybody else? Thank you, Lavanya. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. yeah Lavanya. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, Vikram. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I think to start off from where Abhishek left, I think Abhishek, maybe we all face such situations sometimes in life. So I guess uh, we'll have to continue to play where it lies until we find our purpose. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, hi, Don. Uh, it was a pleasure hi. having you. And uh, hearty congrats on your book launch. So Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, intrigued by the title and the basic premise, uh, Don, because uh, the crux of the premise and uh, the tagline, uh, winning at the game of life with the rules of golf, uh, it looks like something uh, particularly uh, targeted towards the uh, golf uh, aficionados. So was this uh, something that uh, uh, was deliberately done like, okay, the golfing community would be our target uh, readership? Or uh, what there is any apprehension that uh, maybe the persons who didn't know golf, uh, it might not appeal to them. So how did it work out like? I thought it would, when I, as I was writing the book, I started thinking of golf, uh, you know, that I would go to all of, uh, uh, go around to all the golf, what do they call it? Pro shops uh, okay. and, and get them to carry the book. But somehow I lost lost that in the publication of the book um and that's why this time i'm I, i've heard you guys to help me out uh in in terms of marketing uh because i totally failed uh to have a good marketing plan before uh, even though the first two editions sold they didn't sell uh, uh you know, I, I wasn't able to go buy a new car uh, so uh, I'm hoping to do better this time around. Uh, and that's why I've spent a lot of money uh, having the book edited and re-edited and proofread and designed and the cover design. And I mean, God, I've spent a lot of money, but uh, it takes money to make money, as we often yeah, say. And so I don't mind doing that if I have it. Uh, so, so this time I, I, I really wanted to, to, to bang. All the best, all the best on. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Anybody else? Santirin. Okay. And what do you think uh, about the session so far? You want to ask uh, Yeah. Uh, hi, Don. Yeah. Congratulations on your on your book. Uh, the title does seem really good and uh, I look forward to reading the book very soon. Uh, the session was really good. Like, uh, I think it's my second or third session. I don't really know. Uh, but then it was really exciting and a um, few of the excerpts really interested me. I like to not draw a conclusion from it, but then I have a basic idea of how this book is. Like, there are a lot in the market right these days. Uh, on these topics, but then to stand out from it is what makes the book successful. And I really hope and I really wish that uh, this book be successful in that way. And that's what I believe it would be. That's great. Thank you. I just have one question though. Uh, since you are, uh, you have published a lot and uh, you're an expert right now in this field, um, 
what do you have as an advice to us over here i think many of us over here have an idea of publishing a book themselves so we do write but then you know we have a lot of other things that uh, come into our life every day the work uh, i guess few of them family and several other problems so by the time all of this bounces on us and we like uh, we like no this is not going to work out and we drop it but then uh, on the outside when we say this idea to a friend or something like that that's really good idea you should work on it but then it never comes out so how did you make it out like how do you bring the idea out like persistence all that i would like to hear what was your take on it actually i come to the philippines a lot when i'm close to finishing a book i'll come here to the philippines and relax and get away from the noise well not the noise I me mean, uh, you wake up to the sound of roosters crowing here all the time these darn roosters they just crow all the time it seems but other than that uh, this is a wonderful place i go out to the beach and gather my thoughts i now have um nuance on my um cell phone so i can dictate while i'm laying out on the beach uh so uh that that's i i come here there is just something about this place that uh motivates stimulates uh and inspires me and the beautiful women helps mm-hmm. uh, so cuz i'm not married so i that, that's an extra plus so. mm-hmm. I guess each one has has their own uh, inspiration to write. I guess that's what it yes. is. Mm-hmm. That's yes. great. That's great. Yes. Anyway, so Santa go, going to a beach and dictating in an in an app works. I I come from Kerala. There's a lot of beach in Kerala. <laughs> I, I would try that out too. Well, except <laughs> the women part, I think Kerala has a lot uh, of beach. I can work on uh, that. Santa, but. that means you have to go to a desert. Which is not inspiring you. So you should go to a desert and write. Uh, I, I disagree on the beautiful women part. That Kerala oh. does not have. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, thank you so much and uh, all the best. Thank you. Thank you so You're much. welcome. Thank you. I really have enjoyed this event. I really have. And I look forward to doing it again sometime. <laughs> So I I just want to ask another question in continuation to what Santanu has asked. He asked about the challenges in writing. So I would want to just extend to like one more section. What were the challenges in publishing your book? Did you face any challenges and how was it? Well, the basic challenge in publishing any book these days uh, is finding a publisher who will publish the book you wrote. <laughs> and not the book they wanted you to write and it, it's difficult uh and then uh i've noticed that most submissions require you to state uh how you plan to market the book you know and i'm always think well that's what the publisher is supposed to do but the publisher is asking me how am i going to market the book and so um those are but that's just the the nature of the game and there's not much you can do about that you just have to live with it and uh that's why i have started my own publishing company uh to try to bring more types of experimental writing uh to the marketplace uh i have a book i'm working on now from a a couple of teachers up north somewhere that they are reinterpreting the uh uh the trojan war uh and uh claiming that uh this lady from new jersey went back in time and she's the one who saved the day so uh that's a very interesting concept to me uh and it's experimental and so uh i'm working on, it's it's going through the editing process now So um I'm going to be doing that stuff like that. That's that's good. Uh, so I think Dhruva uh I think you switched on your camera. Yes. I'm sorry I didn't give you a chance. <laughs> yeah. So so what do you think how's it been going on? Do you have any questions for Mr. PV? 
Uh, hi, Doug. Uh, congratulations on your book. Thanks. Like, uh, what are uh, like challenges like being a writer? Like, was it a smooth journey, or uh, you felt sometimes to like abandon the book or something like that? Was it a easy ride, or was it like a bumpy ride? The writing journey. How was? Uh, are you married? No, no. Luckily, no. Okay, so you don't have any children. So you don't know what it's like to have a baby. <laughs> Writing a book is a lot like having a baby. It starts out fun, but then it gets awful darn painful. And then when you deliver the baby, you get happy again. The pain is gone. And then when a baby gets a teenager, now you got all kinds of problems coming again. You see, so so it's 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 like a roller coaster ride almost. And but the the one thing that the parent has and the author have has in common is the expectation that this baby is going to make a change in the world. Every parent wants their child to do something fabulous, something fantastic, to make a change in the world somehow, some way. And everybody who writes a book expects that book will make some kind of change, even if it's just in one individual. Uh, I'll give you, uh, there's a book called um, the Purpose Driven Life. Somebody spoke about purpose earlier in this conversation. And there was this time that this guy uh, was in trial for murder. And he uh, somehow got a gun from one of the deputies, shot and killed the district attorney, shot the judge, shot and killed another deputy, and he got away. And this young lady is coming home about four o'clock in the morning, and he forces his way into her apartment. She's sitting there with this guy, and she knows because it's been all over the news, and she goes and pulls this book, The Purpose Driven Life, and she starts reading it to this guy. Of course, she gives him some drugs as well. And so uh, when I tell the story in my religion classes, I say, I don't know if it was the book or the drugs that did the job. But uh, she starts, and she tells this man, look, this guy's facing four death sentences. <laughs> and she said, God has a purpose for your life. Do you know that God gets surrendered? She, she got the guy to surrender by telling him God still, in the midst of this mess and the horrible things he had done, God still had a purpose for his life. She made a difference in that young man's life. Little difficult to process and need some time to kind of wrap <laughs> wrap your head around. Okay, I'll get I'll take that one minute to wrap my head around it. In the meantime, uh Punya, Harshita, Kavan, if you anybody has any questions. Yeah hi this is Punam. Yeah yeah Punam yeah hello don many congratulations first of all and Thank i you. look forward to reading this book it's a very hilarious question i have i don't know anything about golf but why do always rich people play golf you know i always get this question like at least in india i don't know abroad <laughs> like whenever i see a movie of big business tycoon are playing you know why it's not a poor man's game that's what i want to ask you <laughs> and is there well, any I'll mention about this book. Huh? Sorry, you know, I say that in the book. Golf's a costly oh. game. 
And it's not like bowling. You can rent the shoes. You can rent the ball. You can, you can't go to golf and, and rent shoes and all that stuff. You got to buy it, and it's expensive. You're it's right. Expensive. You're right. Uh, but, but, but you can make it. You can you can get a, a credit card or something, and you'll be all right. Okay, because as always, I used to see like you know only business tycoons. You know they'll play on a Sunday evening, and you know the poor old uh, poor poor man will be standing with a glass of juice for him. <laughs> so I always uh, thought, "Ki why only rich people like you know a uh, middle class people like us? You know they will always play in India, especially they'll prefer of obviously cricket is the best like for everyone in India, but they will choose badminton. You know." probably yeah. yeah so that's a game which we indians choose for our children or for ourselves you know so golf is something alien to us <laughs> actually yes, yes, and yes. secondly i wanted to ask about the though i don't know anything about the golf i used to play badminton in my college days so how important is the position of a person you know uh, the golf a person in the game you know and is it is is there any mention about this particular aspect in your book because uh, where you stand in life the position of your life plays a very important role and then i as i have seen the game as a ball goes ahead we move ahead and then we put it across you know so some spiritual or philosophical aspect on this is it some uh, yeah, you know, I, I do talk about that um, uh, and because it, it's important. It, as I said earlier, we don't all start at the same place, right? Uh, my dad did not give me a million dollars when I wanted to go into business. Uh, uh, so play it where it lies means that wherever you are in life, make it the best life you can make it. I mean, a lot of great people have come from humble and poor beginnings. You know, we can't all be a slumdog millionaire, but we can certainly do our best uh, to have a good life, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so that's it. You're right. You're, they have a saying in sports that you're not, I see, you can't control the circumstance, but you can control how you respond to it. We Absolutely. cannot control our birth, right? I, I think I mentioned this in a book, only Jesus and the Buddha claim to have chosen to come here. Uh, mm. You know, everybody else get here uh, because two people make it would be and they are the result of it, right? And so, we don't have a saying into the parents to whom we are born. We have to make the best out of, of what we can out of that. I come from a family of 22 children. Uh, we were poor. We got government rations, but I dropped out of high school, and now I have five college degrees. If you apply yourself, play it where it lies, you can get there. And 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 now I can't go to become a member of a country club. I can't afford that. But I think I have a good life. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. And all the best. Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you, Poonam. So anybody else? Any questions? Anyone has any questions for Mr. Uh, can we wrap it up with Hari, sir, then? Yeah, I think yes. Hari, sir? Uh, Sorry, I have a... Don, Don Harish sir is a veteran who served the Indian Army and retired. I'm sorry? He's a veteran who served the Indian Army. Yes. Yes, yes. I served in Vietnam. So, Harish sir, go ahead. Uh, I have a power failure here. And uh, it has been raining since morning. So, I'm not switch, able to switch on my uh, videos. Sorry. Okay. Uh, congratulations, Don, on your release you. uh, of the new book. And uh, I I had a chapter on karma, uh, I mean, uh, on karmic credit, uh, read by Sirisha. And uh, I find it very, very interesting because I have been doing 
a little bit of research myself on the subject. So I would love the uh, love to read your book definitely, and uh, and you have answered the question. The way you answered the questions uh, that has been wonderful to hear. Thank you, thank you very much, and congratulations. You're welcome. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right, I think we have come to the end of the evening. And so, uh, again, a very hearty congratulations. And just we want to know what are your upcoming works and do you have any advice to the upcoming writers? Because all of us here, most of us are here are writers or trying to be writers, publish our first book or uh, trying to write the next story. So what, yes. what is your advice to all of us? You know what makes the best writers suffer? And suffering. not just suffering, and not just personal suffering, but uh, sharing in the suffering of others. Uh, to have empathy for other people. So many times uh, we, uh, we, we look at struggling people and say they're profane or something is wrong with them. Uh, but, but I think the best writers that I know are those people who capture the human spirit, what it means to be human. You know, uh, people who overcome great obstacles in their lives. Um, and, and I'm sure all of us have, have, at some point in our life, faced some terrible obstacle uh, that we had to deal with, and yet we found a way to overcome it. And that's what my book is about, The Play of Where It Lies, is to take responsibility for our lives and, and, and to say that whether or not I make it, uh, uh, I don't know if y'all remember Frank Sinatra, y'all look kind of young to me. But Frank Sinatra had this song that said, I did it my way, you know, uh, and, and it's a beautiful song. It's a beautiful hymn. It's a beautiful testimony uh, to, to, to be able to say that. Uh, when I was in college, I fell in love with existentialism because existentialism is a philosophy about freedom and individual responsibility, right? You know, in, my, in America today, we're facing what they call the great resignation. All these people that resign from work to live off of the stimulus checks. I mean, that's crazy. You know, I took my stimulus check and bought some stock in AT&T. Uh, you know, but, but this is the mentality that so many of people have this entitlement attitude that they're entitled to something. You know, it's, it's just horrible. But writers have always been there to call people to task and, and, and to say, look, we're not making it. We, we need to do something different. You know, look at what's going on in our country and the destruction of our democratic process and our democratic institutions, and we don't have writers coming out and saying, look, we're in crisis here. Now everybody's always oh, just politics, but it's not just politics. Uh, what happened on January the 6th is, is a terrible blow to what America stands for, what any democracy or republic form of government stands for. And, and unless we have writers to demonstrate that, to bring it out, uh, to have filmmakers, to make films, to show people that this is not just politics, this is a terrible thing, you know, now, I hate to say this, but that's how Hitler got started, right? Uh, this same kind of, of uh, turning the people against institutions and, you know, it's, it's terrible, uh, but we need writers. Uh, to shine the light in these dark places, to call people to be better than what we are. Writers have always done that, and I imagine they'll continue to do that. 
Very well said, sir. Yeah. Very well said. Today you have given us a lot of insights. I don't know. What, especially for me, I somehow so many points to process, think about it. It's a wonderful discussion with you. Uh, it was not only about the book, but also the sort of conversation that we had and you bringing out the basics of humanity. But sometimes we are so busy in our life, in our work, we kind of tend to forget about them. Thank you so much for such a wonderful evening. All the best. I think we can wrap it up here with such a nice note of you talking about what makes a writer. And I hope right. everyone here has taken a piece of advice, at least a piece of that advice. And mm -hmm. I hope that we all inculcate that as well in the writing process. Thank you very much. So it's a wrap from me. So anybody else has to say anything, they can still. Uh, any last minute questions? Yes, Hari sir is saying, nice to know you are a Vietnam veteran. Yeah. I mean, even I felt the same thing when I heard you talking. Mm. It's really nice. Yes, thank you so much, uh, uh, Lavinia. Also, and I like the way uh, Mr. Don P. We ended it that to be a writer is to have empathy and is to change the world. Things are not right, and you can't be a bystander. If you're a writer or a filmmaker, you just can't stand passively and let history go by you or your life go by you. You have to make a difference to your book. And it starts with having empathy towards fellow human beings. I think that's a great takeaway. Writing, writer, being a writer is not about just putting some words on a page. It's about give, making a baby that will go ahead and change the world. So. That's right. That's right. And, uh, and with that uh, sense of added responsibility, I think that's my key takeaway from today. Right. So have a great evening ahead, all of you. And we will be in touch, Mr. PV, and yes. hope this global community of readers and writers we uh, grow in, uh, in the ways we come. Uh, and and this is this today's evening uh, session is a good karma, or or, yeah. or or I can say Christ will approve so of this interaction. Yes. Jesus will approve. Yeah. Thank you. So yes, much. of course. You're welcome. Thank you. I appreciate all of you. Thank you very much. Bye. Good night. Good night. Bye. Have a good day, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.